John in Wisconsin. Thanks for waiting. Hi, thanks for having me. Hi, John. Good day. All right, so first off, I wanted to start off by saying um, I was turned on to you guys' show by one of my friends who recently went from being a Christian to an atheist. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, uh, he's a good friend of mine, and I enjoy talking with him intellectually, and I'm more than willing to shift my perspective uh, when I see that I am completely out of place. Um, I'm not going to lie, I'm probably not going to change my entire perspective just based on this one call-in or anything. I wouldn't have expected um, that. I Actually, I would, I would be very skeptical if I had a phone call with somebody and they dramatically changed their position in the course of you know, a 5, 10, 15-minute phone call. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. Um, I did a debate in uh, Dallas, uh, and when the debate was over, there was a guy who came up to me who said, uh, you know, I walked in here, a, a serious evangelical Christian, and you convinced me, and I no longer believe that, and I'm on your side. Um, and I pulled him aside. I wanted to talk to him some more because I wanted to find out what it was that changed his mind because that process is not something that I think is likely to happen in the course of a debate. And so my thinking is, if he changed his mind, maybe he'd been having doubts and had 25 conversations and this was the last one. But if he walked in as a serious committed Christian and we had a, a simple you know, debate about whether or not you should believe in the, the resurrection or whatever, and he walks out an atheist, I'm not convinced that he's actually rational. He might be one of those people uh, who just accepts the last thing you heard, like some presidents that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely appreciate that perspective. But anyway, what, um, go ahead. What, what time? What do you got for us? So I got I got a lot of topics, but I don't think we're going to get to most of them. So first off, I definitely Let, let's really do this. Let's do this, John. Let's try and keep it to one because there's six callers, All and right. if it goes well, then Perfect. we could just make this a regular thing where you call in with the other things on your laundry list. Oh, absolutely. All right, so the main perspective I want to bring up is that being a Christian and also a physics major, um, I see a lot of issues where I want to try and equate science with God. And if I don't see a connection between the two, then it kind of makes me a little bit nervous. So I have personally found connections with all the major theories. Like people are like, oh, God, there's a huge difference between creationism and evolution and they're talking about all the, and I guess they refer to all the different things like Big Bang Theory, planetary and cellular evolution, organic evolution, macroevolution, all those things as evolutions, while I just see them as different major scientific theories. And I've personally equated all those with reasonable, like beyond any personal reasonable doubt, uh, with aspects of the Bible. Of course, I don't know very much about the Bible personally. I don't study it enough, but... Um, well, it there's your first mistake. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but uh, I, I try to I try to equate it uh, a little more that way. And the reason why, one of the main reasons why I don't read the Bible as much, is because I see that the English ones usually tend to be a lot more fallible. They, they don't have the same context as necessarily like the original Greek or Hebrew that's written in, um, and there's a lot of con connotations that are completely missed. Like, for example, like the 40 days and 40 nights in Hebrew just meant it's a really long time, while we see there's a literal 40 days and a literal 40 nights, um, sometimes when it's written in English. So that's kind of why I'm a little more hesitant with that. Uh, but the main so, topic I wanted to get on... Uh, hang on hang on for a second, John, because uh -huh. if, if there was a God, um, mm -hmm. and you, you, have, you, you identify as a Christian, I'm assuming, if I heard, yes, you, I do. If I heard you correctly. Okay. And so you haven't spent a lot of time focused on the Bible because you have concerns about, you know, translation and meaning and all this other stuff. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't it be God's responsibility to make sure that there's a clear understanding of his wishes and, and you know, either the Bible is completely irrelevant, which I don't know how you get to Christianity if, if you throw the whole Bible out. Um, so there must be something relevant about the Bible if, you, if Christianity were true. And then wouldn't the... Wouldn't Yahweh, wouldn't Jesus have an obligation uh, to make sure that you clearly understood the message? So uh, that's, a very, that's a very good point. Um, I don't have a perfect answer for that. Uh, my, my personal perspective is that 
while it would generally be encouraged, everyone's given a choice. And if the translators that are supposed to translate it don't make the right choice with it, or they don't necessarily give it the right feedback, um, it's not going to turn out right. Well, isn't it God's um, responsibility to preserve the record? I mean, if, you, if you're going to communicate with your, your creation, and you've decided that the best way to do this, and I would argue that this is a particularly stupid method, is to reveal information to individuals in languages that you know will mutate and die out, and then you don't even take steps to make sure that the people who are uh, transcribing it and interpreting it, and th that they get it right. How is this remotely a good plan for a God to communicate a message to people? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I honestly, I don't know really of a good answer for that. Um, I don't either. Well, I, I know, I do know a good answer. I know that based on that, I have no good reason to believe that there is an intelligent, wise God who tried to communicate through a Bible. Uh, there may be a God, and he may be intelligent, he may be wise, but he, no, no intelligent, wise being knowing what was going to happen would communicate in this way. I mean, not even, if you were going to do this, you'd end up with a Bible 2.0 and 3.0 and, you know, direct translations, something like that. And so, if that's the case, and, and there is a God, he's not using this plan to communicate. And he doesn't appear to be using any plan to communicate. He seems to be like the, the universe's hide-and-go-seek champion, you know, for many years running. Um, and that leaves people, what, what reason would there be to believe in Christianity if you don't have any reasonable expectation that the information you have about Christianity is reliable? Um, <laughs> that's actually a really good point. Um, I, I, uh, no, I... I, again, I, I draw a blank on that one. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, John, I'm not trying to, you know, beat you up. I'm just pointing out the things that I had to think about when I was no, a, no, I, a, 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 a Southern I very Baptist. Much appreciate this. It's it's one of those things where I think the most difficult part isn't realizing that we don't have good answers to those questions. The most difficult part is realizing that if we don't, in fact, have good answers to those questions. We cannot have a reasonable warrant to believe the, the religion that is founded upon uh, those problems that we've exposed. And you talked earlier about, you know, uh, looking at scientific models. And I, there was something you said that gave me the impression you were finding a way to make God fit in with the scientific models. Is that what you, did you imp imply that at all? Yeah. So um, my, my perspective is um, I... The main thing that I've ever really read with the Bible, um, aside from some of the gospel, um, is Genesis, and specifically focused on like Genesis chapters one through I think three. Um, and by kind of going through it verse by verse, um, I found how it kind of fits in with the Big Bang theory, going into planetary and stellar, stellar evolution, and going into like macroevolution. Um, and a lot of people don't see it that way, and I don't think they necessarily look at it in the right perspective. Um, so how do, first of all, how do we know what the right perspective is? Because one of the things, if we're going to look, let me, let me do this the easy way. I don't know what the justification is for trying to find a way to make the biblical account match up with the science account. Um, based on what we just talked about, about having no good reason to think that it's a reliable, accurate, you know, portrayal of events. So what, what justification will we have for trying to make it fit? But if the goal is to try and make it fit, I would argue that you're not at all doing anything related to science or reason because that is specifically uh, engaging in interpretation to make what you believe fit the evidence rather than letting the evidence lead to what you should believe. Oh, no, I feel that, I feel that the evidence does, does lead to that. I'm just, what I do is I initially look at, like, for example, the creation um, and I run through how they correlate. And I think that every time that we do make a scientific discovery, my, my perspective is science proves God. So if I, we find further scientific studies, we will find more and more things that correlate with the general message that we receive. Now, I look at creation, I've looked at a few creation myths. I looked at, I think, the Buddhist creation myth, and it was laughably dissimilar to, like, Big Bang Theory and such. But you 
you look at uh, like Genesis and you see that the creation myth holds some water. Like, it's not it's not going to be perfect. It's it's just how it works because it was written for a non scientific community thousands of years ago and passed down multiple generations by word of mouth before language was even written. So it's not going to be perfect, but I see strong or at least moderate correlation um, with the major leading scientific theories. So let me let me ask you this. I would argue that if the God who created the universe inspired a record of that, that it would actually be accurate. That it that it would be trivial. That it, it would be trivial and important to at least get the order right. Oh, I agree. I agree. And yet, Genesis doesn't no. get the order right, which means that the Genesis isn't what God has. You know, it, it, certainly mm -hmm. the order of events don't match the actual events, which means. Uh, if there is a creator, he's not responsible for what Genesis says, so we can throw Genesis out. Well, let me ask you, where, where exactly do you see it like uh, not matching up? Where exactly do I see it? Um, so the order of events in up, up. the order of events in Genesis is a beginning, and then an earth with darkness enshrouded by heavy gases and water. By the way, I'm pulling this from the Talk Origins archive. So, let, me, let, me, let me tell you the interpretation that I got from that. So, I, well, uh, I wasn't anywhere near done. All right. Then, uh, then so, so a beginning, a primitive earth in darkness, then light, then an expanse of atmosphere, then large areas of dry land, land plants, then the sun, the moon, and the stars, and then sea monsters and flying creatures, and then wild and tame beasts and mammals, and then man. But the real order is a beginning, and then light, and then the sun and the stars, and then the primitive earth, the moon, and the atmosphere, and then dry land, and then sea creatures, and then some land plants. The order doesn't match up. But if you look at it from the perspective of being on Earth, there is some, there is some reasonability with that, because initially the Earth's atmosphere was opaque. Therefore, one who was seeing the perspective of the universe from Earth would not see the Earth and stars until most of these things had cleared through. No, they would see the Earth if they were on the Earth. Sorry, they would, sorry you're right. They yeah. wouldn't see the moon and the stars, my bad. It, sure, but are you saying that there was somebody there to record this? Because, no, no, no. Because, no, no. First, first of all, what you may think about the atmosphere certainly doesn't apply with a thinking agent on Earth to record this. And wouldn't God then know that we would discover the order in which these things occurred and find this glaring error in the account that is supposed to be his? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, but, here's, here's, okay. here's one other question, John, just, just to mm -hmm. mull over. Is there a way, knowing what we know about the, what science has discovered about the facts of the origin of the universe, if you, if you wanted to dig through a religious text from some other religion and find a way to make it fit to the facts of the universe, don't you think you could do that too? I think it would give it viability, yes. Well, no, 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 I'm not talking about whether or not it's viable. I'm saying you've done this with Genesis. Hind mm -hmm. Hindus are far closer to the age of the universe, you know, mathematically 13, 14 billion years. They're in the, at least in the billion-year ballpark uh, of this. Um, if you talk to Muslims, they will go through the Quran with a fine-tooth comb, pointing out how it, it, it's apparently uh, explained everything in science. Here's the problem. It doesn't actually explain these things. We learn about them, and then people go back in and read that into the passage, that a fetus looks like uh, chewed gum, uh, that sort of thing. That's fair. So, so the question is, if we don't have any good reason to believe we have a good record of what God wants or thinks, or whether he exists, and we don't find the Bible particularly reliable, then there would seem to be no reason to try to make the Bible fit scientific facts, because what we know about science, well, well you know, the Bible says bir bats are birds, but we don't classify them that way. And you could say, well, you know, to a primitive person, it was a flying thing, and that's as good. That, and I, I would agree that a primitive person would look at a bat and put it in the same category as birds. But it's not. And the author, uh, if it were a god that knew the future, would know that we would discover that and there'd be his problem. Now, I'm not raising the bats, birds verse as, ah, ha, ha, this is a big takedown for, you know, Yahweh. Um, no, the thing is, it also gets a lot of other things wrong with regard to human interactions and morality. And, you know, I've talked about slavery pretty much every week on this show for the history of the show, it seems. Um, 
but why, what is the motivation to try to make a particular religion that you like, that you've acknowledged you have difficulty justifying, fit in with sci scientific findings? Because the fact that they are, you may be able to find a correlation between them doesn't tell you anything at all about whether it's true, because here's what happens. There are a whole bunch of different creation myths, and human beings trying to answer the same questions. We are generally similar. This is why our myths are similar. This is why our superheroes are similar. This is why whenever we have something that's unknown, there's a limited pool. Why, where does lightning come from? Oh, it comes from Thor. It comes from Zeus. It comes from the gods. It comes from this. Because we couldn't really say, oh, lightning it comes from uh, that amoeba or, or that, that snail on the ground. Nobody would ever, ever think that. So we, we limit that. So by trying to answer questions with limited information, coming from limited minds, it's hardly surprising to me. As a matter of fact, I'm surprised that creation origin stories aren't actually more accurate. And every time they try to be specific, they tend to get it wrong. It's in the general things. Mm -hmm. there, there's a way, poetically, metaphorically, to, to make the, the ancient Egyptian stories uh, true, you know, uh, with the sun god carrying the sun across the sky. Well, we know that's not what actually happens, but from the perspective of that person, that was their best understanding of it, and you know what? It was pretty accurate. Uh, I, okay, I'll, I'll give you that. Um, the, the thing, okay, so let me, let me turn this around on you real quick. So okay. If I were to tell you back in, um, I don't know, 4000 BCE, uh, before there was Really, okay, so like in, in, um, in ancient Israel, if I was to tell you, okay, so 3.4 billion years ago, by the way, a billion is a, a one with nine zeros following. By the way, a zero is a concept you guys haven't come up with yet. It, 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 you're going to lose the whole story. Um, I mean, the, the beginning of Genesis is not meant to be the focus of the story. It's meant to be kind of a background of what's happening and what's going forward. Well, it's, so, yes, you can say that now. But prior to that, didn't people think that this was literal and accurate and, and accurately got the order of events right? And are people not fallible? Well, yeah, but f you have a scenario where for thousands of years or a, gr a long time, people thought the order of creation was one thing because that's what their holy book told them, and it was wrong. And how did we correct that? Did we get a new revelation from God? Or did we go out and find the information ourselves? We went out and found it for ourselves. Now, I agree with you on this, because when I, when I follow religion, I don't think that that should promote intellectual laziness. I actually condemn a lot of Christians for that perspective, because they say, oh, well, why is the sky blue? Well, God made it that way. No. Yes, that's the case. But it's not just that. It's the Rayleigh really scattering effect, because the way that the atmosphere works. Mm -hmm. And so if you stop shy, you're not only not pursuing true wisdom, you're not really pursuing what God made for you. Well, I would agree that you're not pursuing true wisdom. I just don't agree why you call it what God made for us, because I don't see any reason to think that God made anything for us. And if I were God, which is the title of the book I'm working on, which is why it's kind of easy for me to dig on these particular topics, um, I, I could have created a universe and individuals, and I could have communicated with them in a way where they understood it and understood it correctly and accurately. Right? Yes, you could have. Now, the question I have for you then is does that allow for a free will and a choice in faith? Okay, do you believe, do you believe in uh, Satan? I do, yeah. Okay, so under the normative model, Satan, devil, Lucifer, whatever, he has been in God's presence, absolutely knows that God is uh, powerful, uh, mm -hmm. knows the accurate order of creation, and yet still chose to rebel, demonstrating that there's no conflict between God revealing himself to someone and them exercising their free will. That's fair. But, but at the same time, giving a definitive showing that God is there also can allow for a, well, why is this? I don't know, I'll ask God. 
uh, instead of going and finding it out for yourself. Well, that's it but kind of beats the point of curiosity. So this is this seems to be kind of a, of a lazy retreat from that. I I know my parents exist and I know they have rules. I can still disobey them. Uh, I know that there are people out there who have the answers. I, I could skip to the end of the book, but I don't. Um, I could, when I'm working on the, the Sudoku on the airplane, I could flip over a couple pages and get the numbers that I'm just not really, uh, I'm tired of this, I'm bored with it. I can do it. And, you know, uh, the fact that something exists doesn't mean anything about what you have to do about it. For example, a god could reveal himself to me right now, and I would definitely believe that that god existed, but that doesn't mean that I would worship or admire or respect. That's true. So, so now we've, we've dispensed with the free will excuse for why God won't reveal himself. Why then isn't there a Damascus Road experience for everybody? Why is he playing favorites? Sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear you right there. Could you say that again? So we've dispensed with the idea that free will is a roadblock to God revealing himself. And if that's the case, then why isn't everybody deserving of a Damascus Road experience? Why is God playing favorites and selectively doing it? Also, wouldn't a God understand that selectively picking people out sets up an, a, a problem of epistemic warrant for everybody else? So from what, the way I see it, Doubt is one of the most important things about increasing your faith um, and experiencing trials, tribulations. Why would you want to and, increase faith? Well, why wouldn't you? Faith is not a reliable pathway to knowledge or understanding. I see no use for faith. Why would God want you I to have disagree. faith? Okay. Because sometimes when, when you go through discouraging times, if you... Okay, so I'm going I'm to relate this to gambling for a second which may not be the best idea for me to do. Uh, but when you gamble, you occasionally get, you get, um, you get limited feedback, you get limited rewards. Once every uh, three times for the first time, you get a reward. Once every 17 times after that, and then it just it varies. You never know when. Because of that, in psychology, it becomes extremely addictive, and it is extremely difficult to quit. A lot, with that same for, for topic, some people. You have, yeah, it's, it's, it's much more difficult to quit than other aspects of, or other, other uh, types of... Um, I, I'm just trying to figure out what this has to do with faith, because as somebody who gambles, so, I don't, yeah, not exercising so, faith. So, um, my, my point is then, um, with that same kind of idea of a limited reward system, of it only occasionally happens, people have a tendency to stick with faith more, which means they hold out away from despair more often. No, 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 you're not talking about faith now. You're talking about hope and whether or not there's, there's a benefit to hope. Oh, no, that's a fair point. Um, and if my, hope, if, if my hope is proportional to the evidence it, it, and it's based on reason, wouldn't that be better? I mean, if John is spending his life uh, with a positive hope that he's going to be uh, the next president of the United States or president eventually, and, and actually... You know, like the odds of that are one in a million, but he thinks the odds are closer to one in one in one hundred. Doesn't he actually have a hope that is potentially damaging? At the same time, though, um, a lot of the people that you see in history are those that were too stubborn to quit. Those that are your, the famous names. You know who are you know, the people who are too stubborn to quit are the people who are mired in religion and try to use faith as the justification for it. That would almost be definitionally too stubborn to quit. They're refusing to. They're also the names that are known most often in history. Well, in general. Just, so is Hitler. Oh my gosh! Did I just lose everything because I mentioned Hitler? I, I'm not. I'm not God concerned man. about who's most mentioned in history. I'm concerned about whether or not people have a good reason to believe things. And, if, and, and basically, at this point, you're now arguing that, seemingly arguing, that there's a good reason to believe in God based on faith because it makes some people's lives better and might get them mentioned more in history? No, no I'm, what I'm saying is that those that pursue un, like, unrelentingly are those that more often succeed because those that are wise and then say, oh, my chances are actually extremely low comparatively. 
are those that don't try and as such don't succeed. I don't know what this has to do with God and faith. You're right. I think we got sidetracked. Well, couldn't couldn't God unambiguously reveal himself to you and still give you kind of that the random rewards model that you you know you compared gambling with that if you don't know when your rewards are going to be you're going to have more faith I think is what you're getting at and couldn't God uh, still reveal himself to you but uh, but not reward you consistently hey I'm God and I'm going to be watching you and here's clear confirming you know evidence that I exist but you're not going to necessarily know when I am or am not going to interact in your life but you definitely know that I'm here right Yes, however, I personally don't think that that would make me as motivated to go through the trials and tribulations of my everyday life. I would constantly be going more, God, get me out of this, God, get me out of this, God, get me out of this, I'm lazy here. And it would develop a mindset of being coddled constantly. Okay, don't, of don't, people, don't, like don't people do that anyway? Yeah, they whether, whether God has revealed himself to them or not, don't they do exactly that? Aren't there people who spend the vast majority of their lives convinced that a God can get them out of stuff? Or at least pray for what they want, the way they want things to be. Oh, Lord, help me yeah. get through this test. Lord, don't let my, my car get repossessed. Lord, please let my mom not die. People don't, don't do that all the time? I mean, they do, but they still okay. go after ways to find it for themselves. If they do it all the time, then wouldn't it be better for them to have a direct, clear revelation of God and have God say, I'm not going to be answering your every whim. I want yeah. you to know I exist, and I want you to know what I expect of you. But, you know, if you're in a tight spot, don't just go reaching out to me. You're going to have to do a lot of this yourself. That's what a parent would do. I mean, why is it that it's so easy for me, as a fallible human being, to be a better God than God? Because, okay, so we're also looking at this from a finite perspective. With the suppose, Okay, so supposing God exists... Okay. He has infinite wisdom and infinite perspective. Okay. So, well, okay, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going for the cop-out right now of... Mysterious ways. Humans, how can we possibly know? Yeah, um, yeah. So, the, perspective is, but and I'm glad you went this I'm, way because this is actually one of the chapters in the book, is this idea of, oh, we're limited beings, so we don't have the perspective of God, so we can't assess what, what, what God could or couldn't do or should or shouldn't do because we can't know as much as he does, and he has good reasons uh, for not doing the things that we think he should do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, you know what you know I, what that I, is? That's I, garbage. I, 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 that is that I is know. that is a garbage excuse because it could also be the case that God doesn't have good reasons. That matter of fact, we are correct, or that a God doesn't exist. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. so, well, but, so I agree with you. I understand that your perspective you have a much better perspective on this. I agree with you on that. Yeah, well, However, the, my, my thing is my, my thing is, John and, and I, you know, there's a whole bunch of other people waiting. I don't mean to just cut the call off, and I will let you yeah, no, get right. to this point. But if we, can, if we agree that even that potential explanation does not get us to any sort of warrant, it's, it's along the lines of, well, that's exactly what an innocent person would say. That sort of inquisition, it, it, it seems similar to me. Uh, of course you would say that, you know, or a guilty person would say that they're innocent. Uh, to avoid conviction. And a God has a good enough reason to not do the things we expect. But there's a bigger problem here, and that is, if there's a God, if you were a God, and you had good reasons to not interact with humans the way they would expect, don't you think you could find a way to communicate this in a way that doesn't violate uh, or, or expand this problem? And if it is in fact impossible, aren't you ultimately responsible for that problem as you created the system and the limited beings, and now you're putting a completely unrealistic, unreasonable expectation on them to be able to figure out and accept things for which you yourself know are impossible and, and beyond evidential warrant. So, what I have to say about this is that part of why I went after physics and why I'm pursuing science is because from my perspective and the way that I see it, being a Christian, I know since God is infinite, the world that he has created, is, uh, the universe he's created, has infinite like amount of knowledge for us to pursue. So I know for a fact that my field will never really end. We'll never find some solid theory of everything. If we do, that will probably be evidence that God doesn't exist. 
uh, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, and string theory doesn't count because it's unfalsifiable. We have no way of possibly proving it. Uh, so it becomes a philosophical debate at that point. Uh, but in any case, because I know that my pursuit of curiosity will never end, that's one of the things that I'm most thankful to God for. And the worst part about being a Christian is I know that based on my understanding of God, no matter what we say, we'll not be able to prove anything because God, if he exists, is unfalsifiable because of how he works. If he does exist, there will be some evidence down the line that he truly doesn't, which I hate, hate, hate that. Because the only form of evidence that we have that for ourselves is anecdotal. We have no possible way to prove God's true existence. We have correlations. We have small things that say, okay, maybe this is actually the case. But we just we can't. We can't prove it. Is, so the best thing we can do is just hope that no one, or not really necessarily hope, but expect that no one is going to have a definitive, nope, you're wrong. And I and, would say the best thing you could do is to not believe something until there's sufficient reason to believe it and not just sit there saying, I believe this, or, or as you said, you know that God is this and you know God's characteristics and you know that God is falsifiable and limitations and I hope that nobody ever proves God wrong. All you're doing is talking about how much you want this to be the case, not how much warrant there is to accept that it's the case. And that's not the way science is done. It's not the way phys physics is done. Uh, it may be the way string theory is done, but, you know, that's a conversation for another day. And my, my friend Lawrence Cross may object to that. Maybe I'll talk to him about that the next time we do an event. So, you, okay, I, I understand where you're coming from. That. That's a very good point. I, I'm just, I, I, know, I know you believe, and I know it's frustrating that you believe while acknowledging that you can't find a good reason to believe, that you've accepted an unfalsifiable proposition. And while you may, in fact, be viewing this uh, in a science-ish way, uh, I don't see how this is, is good skepticism or good science because the time to believe something is after there's warrant. The time to uh, there, point to another scientific model that has this characteristic of unfalsifiable, which we think we should go ahead and just accept. That, that's, the, that's the foundation of what Popper was teaching us. That's a good point. But on that note, I want to get on to some other callers uh, real quick. But you're, please email, yeah. call back in some other time. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for talking with me. Thanks, John. Okay. He's, he's making a lot of funny noises. Yeah, we're, I, th I think that's the machine in the other room that we're hearing in our ears. <laughs> okay. uh, but it could be, it could be. Well, no, it happened after the call was off. Uh, but, you know, stuff like that happens in a live show. There it is again. There it is. Yeah. I wonder if we're getting pop-up notifications and spammed with ads and if the whole thing's going to explode and the show's going to end before we get to... Oh, no. I, I, I went ahead and, and, and kind of ended that because John you know, and I had talked for a long time and I wanted to get some more thoughts in from you. Uh, hopefully that's not mine. Nope. I think it is you. Uh, I don't know how I'd be coming through the headphones. Oh! Look, go ahead and talk, John. Oh, okay. Matt is muting his PC now. I don't know if that's going out on the air, but uh, anyway. Live show. Yeah. He started to make a point. So I have earbuds in so that I can clearly hear the caller and, and us, and, and that means that I don't hear that it... The sound's actually coming from this machine right in front of my microphone. Which is proof that I'm not going to get everything right. <laughs> I, I like that call, and, and one of the things is... Uh, we talked about this before, about this idea of referring to people who believe uh, as if they are intellectually inferior. And you know, I've talked about how you know, my, my IQ didn't go up when I stopped believing. I just got a better access to better information and a better perspective on it. Um, and the thing they find most interesting about that call is that it, John hadn't thought through some of the things. You know, oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, and certainly didn't change his mind over the course of the call. But I'm confident that John will at least think about those things uh, because for somebody who cares about truth and cares about science, I think the, the, the most troubling thing for me was you just, you just believe and you hope that nobody comes along and proves you wrong. I, I know that we do that sort of thing. We, I, we all 
do that sort of thing yeah. about something. But I don't think that we should do that sort of thing. And I think if, it, if, if we were exposed to the fact that this is what we're doing, you know, uh, here's an example of me doing it. I've had problems with my eyes for a while. Occasionally they'll get blurry, it'll get better, get fixed. I need to go see an ophthalmologist. I know this. I know this from the science. Uh, uh, I know this from my various health conditions. I have not done it. Something else slightly more important than whether or not I could see clearly uh, has come up at every opportunity. And so I'm sitting here hoping that the situation doesn't get worse, despite the evidence that it probably is getting worse. And I'm hoping it doesn't get too bad before I actually go see the doctor. I'm being stupid. I am, I am doing the very thing that I would have criticized John for doing with regard to a god. The difference is, is that when it's pointed out to me, I happily acknowledge, uh, not, not, too, not too happily, that this is what I'm doing, and it motivates me to stop doing it, yeah. which, which is why I'll be having an appointment with an ophthalmologist soon. People are really good at, at rationalizing. Everybody is. And, and you mentioned it in the call that, you know, you take what you already believe and then you try to retrofit it into, uh, into this thing that you want to believe, so trying to retrofit it into the Bible and uh, that, that backwards thing. And I see that all the time. People latch on to something and so then they go looking for evidence to support what they already believe. And we do it in all avenues of our life and it's something you have to consciously be aware of and try not to do because it's, it's a really natural thing to do to reinforce your own beliefs that already exist. So there's nothing that John's doing that isn't perfectly normal. It's just kind of your awareness of it and your application of skepticism and reason and scientific method that kind of gets you out of that trap. There's a number of things that I'd, I'd love to get a chance to talk to John about. Maybe he'll call back in on another week when I'm on. Um, one of them is, when you, when you have this sort of model, how much does your God belief affect your other decisions? I mean, certainly we know people uh, who are in specific versions of Christianity where uh, what they believe about uh, abortion or climate change or whatever that they've derived from their religion is going to affect who they're going to vote for, what policies they're going to... I don't know how much that in, uh, affects what John thinks uh, and how, how he votes. Um, when, you know, if you haven't bothered to spend much time looking at the Bible and you really don't expect it, it to be accurate, um, maybe you're not against same-sex marriage. You know, maybe this is where the, the moderate to liberal uh, theists come from. Uh, but my problem is, is that, yes, it's true that fundamentalists can become liberal and moderate believers. You know, they, they get away, they, on occasion, they, they throw away the things that are clearly problematic, but they just want to hang on to this abstract notion of God. But I've also seen it work the other way, where once somebody becomes convinced of this abstract notion of God, uh, instead of having a conversation with me now, what if John had had a conversation with me 25 years ago? And my conversation with John went a little differently. Well, John, you believe that the Bible is God's instruction book for your life, that they, you believe that there is a God, you, you're not expecting everything to be perfect, but why is it you haven't bothered to study it? What is it you're afraid of? I mean, if this is God's book that he wants you to give, shouldn't you have good explanations for why you have problems with it? Because maybe the problem is you. Maybe the problem is not with God. Maybe the problem is not with the transcription or the interpretation. Maybe the problem is you. Maybe there's something in your life, something in your heart. I can't keep doing this because <laughs> it's, it's uh, vile. But if that kind of conversation happened, that's how you move someone who is a liberal, you know, kind of Christian towards fundamentalism. Uh, because if the book says, if a man lies with another man as he lies with a woman, my friend Keith Lowell Jensen would say that's advice about positions. You should just lift up a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but if the book says that, and the, the general view is that this is, you know, a declaration that homosexuality is an abomination and they are deserving of death, um, boy, that's kind of important. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an atheist in part because I took seriously uh, what I thought my obligation was as a Christian, which was to have good reasons for my beliefs. Uh, I want to try and get to one, maybe two more callers. Uh, 